You know, there's a lot of benefits in keeping your mouth shut. And I'm specifically talking about nose breathing, okay? When you are sleeping and exercising, which I think you're going to find quite interesting. Now, typically when you think about nose breathing, um, you're probably going to think, wow, I'm restricting my airflow. So I'm not going to be able to breathe as much, which is true. You're actually restricting your airflow about 50% when you breathe through your nose versus the mouth. But there's some very interesting things that occur when you practice nose breathing. You would think you would not get enough air, but actually you do get more oxygen delivered to your tissues than if you were to breathe through your mouth. Why is that? Well, there's several things. Number one, when you breathe through your nose, the nose, the sinuses act as a humidifier. So they definitely um, help you to moisten the air as it goes into your lungs. Also, that can actually protect the lungs because if you're breathing cold, dry air, that can really irritate the lungs and actually increase the risk of inflammation in your lungs. Secondly, your nose acts as a filter to um, filter out particles that can end up in your lung as well. And it also can act as an immune barrier to protect the lungs against pathogens because the pathogens can actually be effectively dealt with in the sinuses and not end up in the lungs. Has to do with what's called the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R effect. And what this is all about is that it takes CO2 to be able to take that oxygen that is in your blood and push it into your cells. Now, CO2 is not just a waste product. It's a very important gas to get oxygen deep into the cells. So even if your blood is saturated with oxygen, it doesn't mean that that oxygen is going to passively get into your cells. It has to be released with the help of CO2. And this is why someone in a panic attack that's getting too much CO2 because they're breathing, they're hyperventilating, they're going to get an altered ratio of too much oxygen and not enough CO2. And so they're going to go into a panic attack because they're literally starving from oxygen. Then when they balance out their CO2 and oxygen, they can actually finally breathe better because they're finally getting oxygen deep into the cells. Now this also parallels when people get oxygen therapy. They can actually become toxic with oxygen because they're literally starving their cells of oxygen when they get oxygen therapy because they have lesser amounts of CO2 to deliver it into the tissues. Despite having this uh, hemoglobin, the, the protein in your blood being saturated with oxygen, it's just, it's not going anywhere. And so one of the side effects from oxygen therapy is dyspnea. What is that? Difficulty breathing. They might get chest pain, coughing, pulmonary edema, that's swelling in your lungs, twitching in the hands, which I'm gonna explain in a little bit, and also tinnitus, ringing in the ear. And sometimes when people get sinus surgery, they develop a very serious, terrible side effect, which is called empty nose syndrome, which their sinuses get all dry and crusting, and um, they have a very difficult time breathing, they're constantly feeling out of breath. 77% of people with that symptom um, hyperventilate. It's just a terrible condition. Now, why did I talk about that? Because I wanted to talk about the importance of sinus breathing and having all the structures intact. Because you need these turbinates in your sinuses. You need the mucous membranes to be able to balance out oxygen with CO2. And like I think I mentioned before, when you nose breathe, you increase the amount of oxygen that is in your cells uh, by about 20%. Now there's another really interesting component part of this I wanna talk about. Uh, there's a condition of low CO2, it's called hypocapnia, which you basically don't have enough carbon dioxide and that is relevant because we're talking about the importance of CO2, but there's all these different triggers or causes to having this condition of a lowered amount of CO2. Asthma, COPD, chronic, obstructive pulmonary disease, panic attacks, anxiety, lung infections, of course, anemia, because you have this problem with oxygen because of iron, but also something called glycated hemoglobin. Now, what, what is that? Well, if you ever had a diabetic test called an A1C, they're basically measuring the destruction of the hemoglobin from sugar. Because when you combine that protein with sugar, becomes glycated. It's no longer really usable 
And so people that have a higher level of A1C, because they have more glycation in that protein, have higher levels of CO2. This is why diabetics apparently have a hard time getting oxygen and breathing and healing like people that don't have that disorder. And don't forget mouth breathers, because apparently they can't keep their mouth shut, also have higher amounts of CO2. And so when you have a condition where you have lower amounts of CO2, that then causes your body to be more alkaline, not acid, alkaline. And that's called respiratory alkalosis. You get cramping, abdominal pain, because your muscles can't deliver oxygen because the person is too alkaline. Another symptom would be laryngeal spasm. You're going to be having irritation in the, in the throat. Uh, they'll probably have a chronic cough. Uh, bronchospasm, like spasm in their lungs. Tingling in the lips, in the extremities, like your hands and your feet. And tetany, that little twitching that you get on your tissue. That's all alkalosis. Now, anytime you get alkalosis, that can lead to a lowered amount of calcium in the blood. That's called hypocalcemia. Okay, hypocalcemia. Let's take a look at those symptoms, which is interesting. When you don't have enough calcium in the blood, you really irritate the nerves and the muscles. They become overexcited. And so you have a lot of neurological things, which is kind of similar to like peripheral neuropathy from a diabetic, but this is coming from a low level calcium in your blood. Also, you may experience cramps, okay, just because you don't have enough calcium in there. Tetany, that twitching, as well as abdominal pain and difficulty breathing, okay? So breathing problems can also occur with that. So they kind of cross over to that alkaline problem as well. But there's one more symptom that's very interesting as well, and that has to do with what calcium does to the clotting factors. Apparently, calcium is involved in clotting. And so when you don't have enough calcium, you can get bruising and these little purple dots or specks on your lower legs that can occur. That can be hypocalcemia. And on the flip side, if you have way too much calcium, okay, that can lead to excessive amounts of clotting. And so there's even studies um, like postmenopausal women who take a lot of calcium developing strokes and even heart attacks because of the clotting effect. So it's not just vitamin K1 that's involved with clotting. Calcium is also involved. And without calcium, you can't clot at all and you'll get a little bleeding going on and that can show up as black and blue marks in certain places in your body. Now, when you have um, hypocalcemia, not enough calcium in the blood, yes, that can come from low levels of CO2, but it can also come from other things as well. When your parathyroid gland is not working, when you have a hypoparathyroid gland, uh, you can have problems with low calcium in the blood, liver problems. It could also come because you're not consuming enough vitamin D. It could come because you're not consuming calcium in the diet. You have no dairy. It could also come from high iron. It can also be created from not having enough magnesium because magnesium is also needed to help you absorb calcium. Out of all the glands in your body, the parathyroid is the one that controls calcium. And um, when people have surgery, for example, to the thyroid gland, and they remove the thyroid gland, a lot of times they damage the parathyroid and then they start having problems with that. So what does all this have to do with nose breathing? Nose breathing helps to increase the right amount of CO2 into your body to help then really release that oxygen deep into your cells which is going to help oxygenate your brain and your muscles, especially when you exercise, especially when you sleep, when you really need oxygen. In fact, those people who snore typically snore because they're a mouth breather. I mean, try this experiment right now. Close your mouth, breathe your nose, and try to mimic snoring with your sinuses. Now, you could probably do that if you have a stuffy nose, but if you don't have a stuffy nose, it's almost impossible to snore with your mouth closed and because you're breathing through your nose. It's not just about oxygen in your blood. It's actually about oxygen that actually takes it that one step further deep into the cells. And if you have more oxygen in the cells, you're going to be less stressed. Now, since we're on the topic of oxygen and CO2, if you haven't seen this video, check it out.